This was excitement on four wheels. It's something you don't get from any other vehicle. Mind-blowingly noisy. It looked like something from outer space. It goes like hell. If you sneezed, you ended up in the ditch. The true classic British sports car. Most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life. Colin Chapman was Lotus. Colin Chapman founded Lotus. Colin Chapman was the dynamic behind the growth and the enormous success of Lotus. He was a first-rate engineer. I think he'll go down in history as as great an engineer as Brunel. Some will argue it's a shame that he got involved with motor cars because the Concorde would have been a better aircraft if he'd been on the design team. When he first got into motor cars, trying to supplement his um, inadequate uh, college grant by buying and selling used cars. Then he decided that he would try racing one, and he did rather well in it, because he was a crazy fast driver. Well, the Mark I, the Mark II and the Mark III were basically home-built cars in a garage, and then he went on, he never built a Mark V, the Mark V was always, that Mark was reserved one day for a 100 mile an hour Austin 7 car. But then the 6 was the, the, the forerunner of the 7, and the 7 itself was where we, Lotus got into volume. Driving this car is very much to put yourself at one with the road. Unlike other car manufacturers, perhaps that try to isolate you from the road, Chapman tried to get you as close to it as possible, get as much feel back into the whole being. It's a, a wonderful experience. I mean, contemporary journalists at the time described it as a four-wheel motorbike and somewhere around about half a hundred weight. Therefore, they could use a much lighter and smaller power unit, which was always Chapman's philosophy. Basically, he considered that speed really was lightness at the end of the day. We asked the customs and excise, if you, if you build a car from various parts, uh, from various sources, do you have to pay purchase tax? And they said, well, no. So Colin said, well, how many sources? And they said, well, more than one. <laughs> so when you bought your Lotus 7, you got two invoices. <laughs> and you paid no tax. Basically the tub would arrive, uh, less the interior, and the wings, and he would put the whole thing together, put the engine in, uh, during the course of, say, a week. Instructions weren't given as such, you weren't allowed to supply instructions. Basically what you would do is get a copy of the sports car on Lotus owner, and in there a journalist would have had one of these cars to build, and he would have described how to build it. The people that would have bought these cars would have been uh, sports cars enthusiasts that actually wanted a hands-on build car, something that they could actually feel that they've achieved something at the end of the day. They could drive the car on the road and take it out club and racing if they wanted to at the weekends. It's historically recorded that somewhere in the region of 25% of these home-built cars were actually raced pre-1960. I suppose one of the most famous drivers of this mark must be Graham Hill, who in 1959 went out on a very wet boxing day at Brands Hatch and thrashed all the much bigger, more powerful aerodynamic cars to a sensational victory. In 1973, the production rights of the Seven were given to Graham Nern, who was the Lotus sales agent for Lotus at Caterham. He's continued to manufacture the car and develop the car up until the modern day equivalent. Uh, he's actually using the K-Series engine and the Vauxhall engine in the car now. It's been very successful and they've instigated their own race series. It, well, it, it's become timeless. It's a wonderful basic car, no doors, goes like hell, makes lovely noise and it's, it, it was basically cheap and you could win races with it on Sunday and drive it to work on Monday. Everybody, everybody from 17 to 70 wants one. It's brilliant. I love it. I love it to drive. When you drive it, it's exciting. It raises your adrenaline. It makes you feel part of the road, part of the whole thing of driving. It's just like nothing else. Well, with the seven paying the rent, Chapman could now do what he wanted to do, and that was to develop new technologies, and he obviously wanted to get rid of the chassis. 
And the way to get rid of the chassis was to design a monocoque fiberglass, and that was quite an innovation, fiberglass body shell, put a lightweight, high-powered engine in it, put top-class Lotus suspension in it, and then build a car that was aesthetically beautiful. This car is a 1962 Lotus Elite. It has a 1216 Coventry Climax engine, which was derived from a fire pump. And in this state of tune, it delivers 95 brake horsepower, which gives it a top speed of approaching 125 miles an hour, 0 to 60 in uh, 10 seconds, and 0 to 100 in just over 20. The car only weighs 10 and 3 quarter, 100 weight, and it was revolutionary in its day. Colin Chapman thought the way to go was to produce a Grand Tourer, if you like, a closed coupe, something that people could remain warm and dry. And he was fascinated by this new material called GRP, glass reinforced plastic. As it turned out, it was extremely complicated to do, and 57 different molds make up this particular car. There is no chassis and only two pieces of steel are in this structure, hence the light weight. And the Lotus Elite is still a most beautiful car to behold from any angle. There's not an ugly way to look at it. Where you look down on it from above, you lie down on the pavement and look at it, you photograph it from any angle, I defy you to find an ugly angle. The car was a, an amazing success. You have to think back at the time when it was penned in 57, the first cars were delivered towards the end of 1958. You had the choice of an MGA or a TR3, big, heavy, ponderous cars. And here you had this amazing, delicate little vehicle that if you sneezed, you ended up in the ditch. Nobody in the motoring public or press at that time were prepared for this amazing razor sharp steering and of course, lightning brakes. Lotus marketing has always been fairly simple. Right from the start, perhaps when Colin Chapman had very little money, he wouldn't want to market through advertising, taking space in magazines, producing expensive brochures. When they were more successful and perhaps had the money to market, they didn't need to. Their racing successes provided the advertising, and Chapman, I think, traditionally didn't provide materials, resources, archives. He wasn't concerned with that sort of thing. Certainly early Lotus material is very factual. It gives a simple picture, simple specifications, and text. If you wanted a Lotus, you had the common sense to work out what pedigree it had got, the common sense to work out that it was fast. You weren't told anything in Lotus material, and you certainly weren't impressed by Lotus material. You were impressed by Lotus cars. Driving an elite today, where we're all cocooned in, in completely hush-hush Vauxhall Cavaliers and the like, this is mind-blowingly noisy. As it doesn't have a separate chassis, the little cabin area acts as a sound box. So you have absolutely everything coming into your ears. You have the rear suspension thumping away, you have the prop shaft two inches from your knee, the gearbox is two inches from your shins. Everything is sitting in there with you. The fuel consumption knocks the spots of virtually every car known to man today and regularly returns over 45 to the gallon at 90 miles an hour. I first saw the Elite at the 1957 Motor Show. Uh, I was nine years old at the time and I thought it was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen in my life and I still do. In the late 50s, cars that Chapman was designing and building were still specifically to win races and they were winning races. The company was getting into single-seater racing. The company was beginning to attract names like Innes Island and Graham Hill both to work in the company and drive the cars. And all over the world the name Lotus meant something. Almost every weekend Lotus cars were winning the length and breadth of the world. At Hornsey in 1957 onwards they were building the Elite successfully. They were building racing cars for sale all over the world and they were winning races. Team Lotus itself was establishing itself, knocking on the door of Formula One and winning other events. And of course the Lotus 7 was paying the rent. 
against this background of success, the company was ready to move forward and more by accident than design, a new car was beginning to take shape that would be built at the new factory at Chesant and this would really put Lotus on the map. This was excitement on four wheels. This car is a Lotus Elan S2, built in 1965. Uh, it was bought in that year as a kit of parts, uh, which was a service offered by Lotus in an effort to avoid purchase tax. You could either opt for the kits or you could buy a ready-assembled car. Uh, this one was assembled by the local distributor uh, and has been in the family ever since. The first ride in this car uh, was obviously in 1965 when I was uh, about three and a half years old and I can remember it vividly. It was at night, I presume it was the day that my father had just bought it uh, and he must have woken me up taken me down into the car and took me up the road. I was actually sitting on the transmission tunnel uh, and I can remember the, the exhilaration and the speed. It seemed uh, a different world to me. That has stuck in my mind ever since. The LAN rose out of the ashes, really, of the, the Lotus Elites. After about a thousand Elites had been produced, Chapman went back to the drawing board and the result was the LAN. Chapman wanted the concept of, of, of chassisless construction to continue into the Elan. Ron Hickman, what the design and development director, wanted to test all the rolling components of the vehicle. So one night at a dinner, Chapman and Hickman designed a one-off test bed chassis by, it was called the fold along the dotted line chassis. They actually mocked it up uh, on, on, on the menu card, like these things you cut out of a Kellogg's cornflake packet. But that chassis proved to be so good, so docile, gave the car such enormous handling and proved so cheap to make that from that day on, we at Lotus adopted the back, backbone chassis concept. The Elan was the first car that Lotus produced that made any money and it was very important, probably a milestone car in, in that respect. Um, the Elite had been a sales disaster. Um, the Elan really was, was an instant success. Uh, it proved reliable, comfortable, it was more, more refined to drive than the Elite. It was a car that was designed really for, for twisty A roads and B roads and that's where it excels. It's comfortable too, that's a surprising factor, especially when you look inside the car and you see the, the seats which are obviously an old fashioned design and they look thin uh, and appear not to have much body to them but I've driven the car for, for hours at a time and I don't get any, any hint of backache at all. Um, driving position is good, it's the classic uh, straight leg, straight arm position uh, and that's probably got a lot to do with it. It's a, an easy car to drive, it's an easy car to drive quite quickly, it's very forgiving um, because it holds the road so well uh, you often don't know how fast you're going and that all round drivability I think is, is what made, has made it so popular. It's the true classic British sports car. By 1965-66, Lotus were in a, an expansion requirement in every possible area. We needed to build more factories. We couldn't get an industrial development certificate to expand in the existing location. And also we wanted a test track. We'd been using the A10 for testing racing cars and road cars for years, and the residents and the police were getting a bit fed up. We were in a sort of um, unionised labour sandwich with uh, Luton just up the road and Dagenham just down the road, both make manufacturing cars. And of course our employees knew what was being paid on the production lines and the overtime and we couldn't meet those figures. And we'd also lose labour to Dagenham and Vauxhall when they really were recruiting heavily. And the other thing was we were dead set against any form of union in the factory. We had enough problems when our suppliers went on strike. And for Chapman, the idea that our own employees might go on strike was absolutely out of the question. He went on record as saying, if this company comes unionised, I will shut it down.
Loads of styling have been done in-house with using consultants like John Frailing, but it was Colin's final decision and Colin's aesthetic eye that decided the styling and set the standard, which was always very high. The first break away from that was when Gigiaro in Italy offered to do a body design on the Europa, and that of course became the Esprit and opened up a whole new era of design for Lotus and a big move upmarket. Less cars, bigger engines, higher prices. Lotus made the Esprit, I think, to capture the Ferrari market. They wanted basically an Italian car design, which they had in Gigiario, and people wanted something which was a match for the Ferrari. As soon as the Esprit was produced, everybody wanted one. It was in great demand. The second Esprit, the Esprit S2, would sold like hotcakes. You couldn't get them for love nor money. The reason most people buy a Lotus Esprit is because of the way it looks, the sharp angular design, the very Ferrari-like look, the Italian styling, not really for the performance. You know, the performance is an added bonus. When we decided to turbocharge the Esprit, when Chapman said it had got to be done, he bought nearly everything with a turbocharger, including two aeroplanes, and they were all studied, and the car was totally re-engineered to take a turbocharger. He didn't just uh, hang one on an engine and see how it would go. So he was always pushing ahead. Everything had to be better and better and better. It's a very exciting car to drive, superb handling. With the HC engine, it's a very quick car. There's very little on the road that will accelerate as quickly as this. The handling is superb in wet or dry conditions. Being a mid-engine car, everything is in the right place. The fuel tanks are each side of the engine. Most of the weight is inside the wheels. That's to say that there's very little overhang at each end. So it makes it a very enjoyable car to drive, very exciting car to drive. A little bit twitchy on the limit because it's mid-engined, but most owners never find the limit. The Lotus Spree lifted Lotus onto another plane. Suddenly, they, they lost their kit car image. The top of the range now is the Turbo Esprit Sport 300, which has bigger wings, bigger wheels, and a 300 brake horsepower engine. Basically, Peter Stevens came along and he rounded all the edges of the Gigario Esprit. The Gigario Esprit owners feel you know, that was sacrilege, it ruined their car, and would, would not give house room to a Peter Stevens car. The same can be said for Peter Stevens designed own cars. They feel the Esprit Gigario is dated and looks old-fashioned. In the cutthroat competition of the supercar or semi-supercar market, you had to produce materials that, in a pile by the armchair, could compete with the other sports car manufacturers, the TVRs or even the Jaguars, the Mercedes sports cars, so that your Lotus material became more significant. I first saw an Esprit at the 1975 Motor Show, which was a, a white S1 Esprit with a gleaming Wolf Race wheels. And it looked like something from outer space. It was just absolutely amazing. Nobody had ever seen one. There was never been another car like it. And it was so futuristic. And I thought, well, you know, I've got to own one of these, but I never, ever thought I would. The, the very word Lotus evolves all sorts of feelings inside. The, the Lotus is more than just a car. It, it's a hobby, it's, it's great fun to drive. It, for me, it's my whole life. You know, everything I do is, is 
all around Lotus cars. From the mid-70s, the British motor industry was having a very bad time indeed. In fact, all luxury markets were really badly hit, and Lotus were particularly badly hit. I wouldn't say the quality of the product was particularly good, so of course you missed out on brand loyalty. Not many Lotus buyers were selling a car and buying another one. So that was, that was a problem. Chapman was not doing well in Grand Prix racing, and as that was his number one love, it's possible that too much time was being devoted to trying to recover the reputation of the racing team. And the company put out one or two bad balance sheets at that time. Um, being a public company by then, of course, that was very important. The company had problems with financing. Lotus did have financing problems. Chapman's brilliantly innovative twin chassis Grand Prix car was, was banned by the FIA. The DeLorean business had gone sour. Chapman was under c colossal stress. And he came home in December 1982 from a sad meeting in Paris and died. When Chapman died in 1982, it was a devastating blow for the company because he was such an inspirational leader to the company and to all the people in the company and to our customers worldwide that we all, had to, we all were rocked back on our feet and we just wondered which way the company was going to go. And it took quite a long time for the spirit of Lotus to really get back up again and get the company back going full speed. It's an incredible company. And it's all there. It's just, it's just an energy that Chapman created. So Chapman is still alive in the way that company thinks. He set standards. People would still say, I wonder what the old man would have done. In the next year or two, we're going to introduce two new cars. The first of which is going to be a very small, very lightweight, very exciting sports car that's going to showcase a whole lot of new technology. It's really going to be following the classic Lotus philosophy of lightweight, simplicity, elegance and huge driver fun. But it's going to, as I say, really look forward into the future, looking to 10 years ahead in terms of manufacturing technology. The other new product that's on the way is a new engine for the Esprit, which is going to carry us forward quite considerably. Colin Chapman was passionate about cars, passionate about engineering and passionate about competition. He wanted to be the best in motorsport. He wanted to produce the most exciting sports cars that the world had ever seen. And I like to think that the people that we've got here today and the visions that we've got for the future will see us doing exactly those things.